Thank you, Dr. Donovan. So I was honored um, to be asked to represent the students in the College of Business and Economics today and introduce our moderator for this evening's Women in Business panel. But first, a little bit about me. I am a junior majoring in business management with a concentration in human resources. Um, and I'm minoring in geography. As Dr. Donovan said, I am an active member of the WVU Entrepreneurship Club, College Greens, and Fair Trade 2.0. This summer, I'm looking forward to traveling to Tanzania for a service learning trip where I'll learn about hands-on sustainable development and human rights efforts. After graduation, I hope to continue traveling and working with non-governmental agencies promoting international social justice. It is my pleasure to introduce Ali goodwin Gregg, a graduate of the Pearly Isaac Reed School of Journalism, which is now the Reed College of Media. She is currently Chief Marketing Officer at MVB Bank. Ali has vast experience in spokesperson training, crisis communications, public relations, event planning, national media relations, message development, and strategic planning. Ali was named a 2005 West Virginia Executive Young Gun and a 2010 State Journal 40 Under 40 recipient. Ali also serves as a national publicist for U.S. Army soldier Jessica Lynch. A native of West Virginia, Jessica Lynch was the first successful rescue of an American prisoner of war since Vietnam and the first ever of a woman. Ladies and gentlemen, Allie Goodwin and Gret. Good evening. Thank you all so much for having me, and it is my pleasure to be your moderator for the evening and to um, have the opportunity to be part of our esteemed um, a group of panelists. Uh, tonight our format includes comments from the panel and then we'll also be doing a conversation which will last about 40 minutes and then we will be taking questions from the audience for those of you interested in asking a question and I know that all of you have questions you're going to ask. But we have a microphone here in the middle of this aisle and a microphone here in the middle of this aisle. If you have a question you'd like to ask when we get to the Q&A portion, if you would just walk up to the microphone and please give us your name um, and your major and your year in school, correct? Did I get it on? Awesome. Then uh, we will uh, let you ask your question. Uh, if you've not already done so, please be sure to turn off your cell phones or at least silence them. This is a courtesy that your panelists have given to you, so if you would please extend them the same courtesy, that would be terrific. Um, to begin, obviously, as I've said, it's my distinct honor to be here. I'm a proud graduate of the Reed School of Media, what is now the Reed School of Media, and a proud WVU alum, as are um, all of you will be one day. And having this esteemed panel of women join us here this evening at the Alumni Center is fantastic. And I hope over the next 40 minutes with our discussion and the panel discussion that we've put together that you'll learn um, and, and find some different opportunities that we're going to cover. Uh, first, I would uh, like to introduce the panel of these successful West Virginia businesswomen. I'll start first on my left with Georgette George. Georgette is currently the president of Monarch Holdings, family of hotels, co-president of affiliate services, and co-manager of Monarch Holdings, of which she manages the administrative and financial operations. She has been engaged in these businesses for more than 20 years. Previously, she held a position in sales management at the Hewlett Packard Company, where she received the President's Award, the company's highest sales achievement award. She also serves as a director for the West Virginia Regional Tech Park, Summit Financial Group, uh, and Summit Community Bank, and the Tamarack Foundation. Georgette George. Our next panelist is Diane Strong Treister. She is the president of Manpower, a local franchise of Manpower Group with 11 offices throughout West Virginia and Kentucky. Manpower is a major employer in the state and with Diane's strong local franchise employing more than 3,000 people and in 2014 within the administrative, industrial and professional divisions. Manpower Group is an international company with offices worldwide in 80 countries, headquartered in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. She attended Rio Grande College and West Virginia State College majoring in business administration. Diane. 
Next, we have Vicki Dunn Marshall. Vicki is the franchise owner and operator of 25 Little Caesars Pizza restaurants, including three states of West Virginia, Kentucky, and Ohio. She started her career at Little Caesars at the age of 15, working her way up in the franchise as a saleswoman at the corporate headquarters before becoming an owner. The West Virginia headquartered franchise is consistently recognized as being in the top 10 operations of the brand, and Vicki has employed employees more than 10,000 employees throughout her 40-year history with the company. Vicki Dunn Marshall. And last but certainly not least is Kathleen Walker, who is co-owner of Epiphany Consulting, where she works with people to provide insights into how they can more effectively communicate and interact. A native of South Charleston, Kathleen draws upon her diverse career background in telecommunications, transportation, healthcare, law, and personal service and industries excuse me, personal services industries uh, when working with her clients and often brings direct experience to the table as it relates to challenges that clients are facing. Uh, Walker went into her own, launching her own business, which is how we first met 15 years ago, Epiphany Consulting in January of 2000 with Kathy Richards after having worked in Charleston and consulting and counseling practice before that. Kathleen. <laughs> Now that you all know a little bit about them, I thought it would be helpful this evening to start our conversation with them telling you their story. So Georgia, we'll start with you. First of all, oh sorry, can you all hear me okay? No. Can you push? Is that any better? Yeah, yeah there, there we go. go. <laughs> okay, let's pull it a little bit closer. All right, first of all, I really do not like public speaking, so bear with me, so. Um, but my life has been geared around small decisions, and at the time, most of those decisions were made not realizing that they had a bigger impact on me than um, I would have ever expected. Um, I started my, I picked my, um, my parents wanted me to be a doctor, so when I was in high school, they said, you need to go be, do that, and I said, I don't want to be a doctor. You don't, they always told me, you don't know what you want to do in four years. I said, fair enough, so I picked biomedical engineering to get me around that one. So I, I wanted to go to, uh, on a high school trip uh, my senior year, so they said, the principal said you can go if uh, you get into a school. So I picked Vanderbilt because they had a biomedical engineering program and 35 years ago there weren't very many biomedical engineering programs. Got to Vanderbilt and found out I couldn't get a job as a biomedical engineer unless I got a PhD. Didn't want a PhD, so I added electrical engineering. Um, so I. My, all I guess I'm trying to say is that small decisions put you on different paths. So I decided um, I was about ready to take an engineering job, and my best friend got a job from Hewlett Packard or HP. My son didn't know Hewlett Packard was HP. So I, <laughs> so since my best friend got a job with HP, I, I wanted to compete with him a little bit. He always beat me on uh, every test I ever had, but I thought I'll try to get a job with them too. They said, you don't belong in engineering, you belong in sales. So I went into sales. And at that time in life, engineers didn't go into sales. I thought, what the heck am I doing? <laughs> so actually, sales was perfect for me. I enjoyed the sciences and I enjoyed math, but really, I enjoyed people. And so I ended up working in sales and sales management for Hewlett Packard for about 10 years. Then my mother fixed me up with my husband, and I moved to Charleston, West Virginia from Philadelphia. It's like, okay, now what am I going to do? And um, I had a choice of doing something with HP or working in the family business. So I decided I wanted the opportunity to work with my dad for five years or so, and um, he and my brother and my cousin and I have worked together now the last 23, 24 years. Um, we're in a family business with hotels, and some real estate, and never uh, in a million years would I have told you that I would be worrying about how how my housekeepers are doing and how many rooms a day can they, how many rooms a day that can they clean. But that is one of the most important things because the housekeepers are the one of the most important things in a hotel business. Because if you don't have clean rooms, you don't have happy guests, and if you don't have happy housekeepers, you don't have clean rooms. So. That's kind of where I, that's kind of how I ended up here. But I never thought in a million years that's where I would be. So I guess what I'm saying is small decisions put you on different paths. Just be thoughtful about them and um, enjoy, the, enjoy the journey. Well, I'm Diane Strong, and it's interesting enough that um, I had the privilege of speaking to some of the students when they were coming in. and. 
one of the girls I mentioned and I asked where she came from and she said, it's in the middle of nowhere. So um, that's exactly my story. I came from a town of probably, I'm not kidding you, 200 people. And that might have been counting the chickens, the dogs. I mean, it was nowhere land in Ohio. Um, and from there, it was kind of interesting in the fact that I would honestly say you all have such a privilege that I didn't have because due to my father being killed in an automobile accident when I was very young, I didn't have the option of going away, uh, living in a dorm, partying, you know, I didn't have any of that. So what I did was um, came right out of high school, started working, uh, making money, um, doing the best I could do, go as far as I could go, and then I went to school at night. So I took all of my uh, classes in the evening, and never know who you're speaking with will get you to a different option, a different opportunity, because I just kept meeting all these great people along the way. I would work as far up as I could in the education system to begin with. Um, met a gentleman that came in. I used to buy a lot of equipment uh, for a brand new joint vocational school. And he said to me, he was coming back from a trip from the Bahamas. And I said, wow, I must have I must be working for the wrong company. And he said, we know every now and then we have these opportunities that we are, um, you know, hiring for salespeople. But also, as Georgette said, females were not really accustomed to being in sales at that time. Sure enough, he called me and said, hey, there's an opening in West Virginia. Would you like to come interview? So um, I came here. There were 41 people that interviewed for the job. And... I landed it, didn't know anything about sales, um, and I was a female, didn't know anything about West Virginia, so I moved here and kind of just started my life uh, selling word processors, you know, before, before <laughs> the iPhone, guys, okay? You know, there's these big old tank, you know, systems. That, they might have to Google that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah Google that one and see. It's like the eight-track tapes, perhaps, yeah. but uh, so I came here. Uh, did extremely well in sales, and then um, left that and decided to go into real estate um, with residential. I'll tell you, that's the only job I hated. Uh, did quite well in it, but it wasn't my cup of tea, as they say. So I got into commercial uh, real estate, and people again said, um, females do not, you really can't lease you know, Office Tower. If you guys are familiar with Charleston, it's Laidley Tower, and I leased that and had to go to Kentucky to go for the interview. And they weren't quite pleased that I was a female. I went back the second time, and they weren't quite pleased. And when they called to make an offer to me, um, I was pregnant with our first child. So that didn't go over well. But I got the job, leased the building. Um, and then at the time, my husband owned two manpower offices, and I love taking from nothing and building into, that was what I was known for in sales, is I love going to brand new territories where I don't know anyone, starting from scratch and building. So um, came to Bridgeport, opened up an office there. Uh, the following year, I came to Morgantown with two small children and opened up the Morgantown office and then just kind of kept opening up offices until uh, we grew it to 11. The one thing I will say along that way is, yes, you do have a lot of bumps. Uh, in the midst of being at Manpower 11 years, uh, my husband was diagnosed with a massive brain tumor. We fought the battle for 22 months. Uh, he passed away. I continued to open up the 11th office after that and have continued to run Manpower. Um, I think the naysayers at the time thought, how could she run 11 offices, raise three small, small children, and also we have a lot of real estate that I run on the side. So all of that background into real estate and sales, uh, pretty much it's what I use today. So that's kind of my story in three minutes. Good job. <laughs> I'm Vicki Dunn Marshall. I came from Detroit, Michigan with the Little Caesars brand. I, I started there at 15. It was the first job I interviewed with them and Burger King. Or, or, no, Burger Chef. You probably, <laughs> none of you remember Burger Chef because it's no longer there. I chose the right one. 
<laughs> Little Caesars paid five cents more an hour, so I went with them. I got two dollars and ten cents. Imagine that. Um, during my my employment there, I, I can tell you uh, part of my success throughout my life has been I've always done the best I could do at whatever it was, even if it was washing the dishes. Figure out a system, do it the best you can, and something new will open up into your your opportunities will open up for you. So. From uh, just being a crew member, I was advanced to assistant manager fairly quickly. Then um, at 17, they offered me a, the manager's position. This is well before labor laws. So um, they offered me a, a restaurant that served beer and wine, and I knew that was wrong. The drinking age was 18 at the time, but I was still 17. So I knew it was wrong. So I'm, I'm always, always about doing the right thing as well, making the right choices. So um, I convinced the supervisor, who he was just out for his own over his own butt, but um, I convinced him that the, a carryout unit without liquor would be the best thing for me. So from there, I, I moved my career up with the corporate uh, headquarters. I went into supervision and training, and and uh, my last position with them was franchise sales. And when you travel the country with with prospective franchise owners and teach them how to do the business, you you realize easy that you know I, I'm teaching people how to do this. I can do this myself. So. Uh, the, the first territory I could get was Lexington, Kentucky. So in 1982, I think, I moved there and uh, started my, my own little chain of stores. And um, it's been challenging over the years. Uh, we've, we've had a lot of ups and downs and, and bumps. And I've, I've closed some stores. I've sold some. And, and, you know, I've had 28 at my peak and down to 16, um, back up to 25 today. Um, it's, it's been a, a wonderful road, and, and I'll tell you the two things I, I concentrate on along the way is, is, number one, I mentor people that I see have qualities in them to succeed, and I, and I try to instill the best of them, bring out what they don't recognize that they can do. And, and the second thing I do is I, uh, I bring in support businesses to make it more fun. You can't always do the same thing, well, at least I can't. Uh, so. Along my, my trail, um, if we needed uh, real estate locations, oh, we started a real estate company and we, we kind of built that on the side and, and we, needed, uh, we needed a maintenance team. So gosh, we got a construction company now and, and uh, uh, my daughter, um, she's into horses. So guess, guess what, I got a horse company. And um, I, I have a sock company in North Carolina, but I don't know how that happened. That, was, <laughs> that, was, that wasn't in the plan. <laughs> and if any of you are interested in that, see me outside, we can talk. <laughs> it's been a great, great ride in West Virginia, and um, I'm here by choice, and I'm glad. And I, I do have to confess one thing. I'm, I currently live in Huntington, and Diane said, good thing you didn't wear green. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening. Um, I am Kathleen Walker, and I just want to say thank you to Laura for getting all this organized. It was nice to get all the emails and the feedback, and to tell you what an honor it is for me to be here with three women that I've always looked up to in our community as far as business women and examples that they've always been for me. Um, I'm kind of the new kid on the block, I guess, to this group. Um, I don't know about you guys, when I sat in your seat, I didn't finish college, which was probably the biggest mistake I thought I ever made in my life was because I didn't finish. Because I had a really strong drive to be independent. So in order to be independent at 18, you thought, wow, you gotta go get a job. Gotta get a job, try to go to school, get a job, try to balance all that. So I did some things like, I was a telephone operator. I worked at UPS, uh, loaded trucks. I was an office manager. Had various careers in my life um, and then I landed a really good job with the Communication Workers of America and was an administrative assistant for them for about five years. In the course of that, my mother um, was diagnosed with breast cancer. So I took about a year off, and um, my husband, we were raising two young children at the time, and he said, by all means, take a year off, be with your mom. So I did that, and then one day, I went to pick my kids up at school, and on the playground, um, a girl that I'd known in the community said, hey, Kathleen, are you about ready to go back to work? And I said, well, you know, I've really been thinking about that. So she invited me to a job interview. 
So that was a little scary, get jumping back out in there after a year. So I went to the job interview and she said, okay, part of this process, you know, in order to be a salesperson for me, you have to take a couple of online assessment tools. And I'm thinking, assessment tools? What in the world could that tell her whether I can sell anything or not? So took the assessment tools, had the interview, got the job offer, and you talk about changing your life. I got my assessment results on a Friday and we had to go to a soccer tournament, right, Diane? <laughs> so I'm in the car reading these results to my husband and he's like, well, good grief. I wish I'd have had that maybe 10 years ago before I proposed to you. I would have <laughs> known a whole lot more about you. So, you know, the power of knowledge, you know what that can give us. It's really a great gift, and feedback is a gift. So I was really intrigued by the process. And so as Kathy, who is my current business partner, as we started this journey together, we were selling for someone else. He was the franchise owner. And about six months into the experience, I kind of got a, a bug to like, okay, we got to be independent. And I knew we had a really good concept in the business, so I talked her into making him an offer, and 15 years ago, we did that, and we were successful. And I feel really fortunate because Kathy and I are able to start every day that we have to work, which we haven't hit the lottery yet, so I just put two kids through college, so I'll be working for quite some time. But we get to start the day with the mindset that we're always here to make good things happen for other people. And that's really the joy that I get out of my work. And that's something that I would encourage each of, each of you when you're trying to decide on a career. You know, we all have these things that come very natural to us or are somewhat easy for us to do. And you really have to really couple that with some passion. Because, you know, work is work. And you really want to try to really derive as much as you can from it. Because that's really important to really find your fit. Because assessments are all about learning how to find where you fit. Where do you fit the culture of the company? You know, how do your capacities fit the job that you're going to take on? And I know that, you know, Georgette and I have worked together for about 15 years, and getting the right fit is critical to being happy. So I think that's something that you really need to think about when you're moving forward in your career. And I've been really fortunate with that. You know, have you ever had an epiphany? Do you know what that is? Have you had an aha moment once or twice? You know, that's the beauty of the word of what we do, because we really want to create that awareness for people in their life. And anytime you can help do that and illuminate that in someone, it's very powerful. So as I said, I do have two children, uh, born and raised in South Charleston, and I'm very active in my community. And um, just want you to know what a pleasure it is to be here tonight. And hopefully we can shed some light on anything that, um, that you need for some inspiration. So thanks for having us. As we get into the discussion, I'd like to start talking about several of you mentioned the role of women and what was the role of women when you were starting out in your careers. And it was noted that at the turn of the century in the year 2000, that the dominant factor for business over the next two decades wouldn't be technology or economics, but it would be demographics. So if you could talk in thinking in the context of diversity and inclusion uh, and being a woman in your field when it wasn't, uh, there weren't a lot of other women around the table and just talk a little bit about how that influenced your leadership style. And Vicki, we'll start with you. Okay. Um, when I w went into the franchise sales department at Little Caesars, it was, it was uh, an eye-opening experience for me. There were three men in the department. Uh, so I was the, the, the only female. At the time, the, um, the reimbursement for hotel rooms was $20 a day, which meant you could get the, the, the hotel that said uh, motel, phones in room, <laughs> with the outside doors. And I just, oh, it was, it was tough. As a young female traveling around helping franchise owners, it was scary. It was, um, but I did it. I, I got over it, and I did it, and I'm, I'm here today. So uh, it's good to face your fears. <laughs> Other thoughts on leadership? I'm sorry. I think, you know, I think leadership is, is really indicative to knowing yourself <laughs> very well. Uh, you know, a good leader sometimes gets pigeonholed. You know, you, it seems like you have to be a real driven individual mm -hmm. or, you know, you've got to be really on it all the time. But to me, it's understanding yourself and then do you really recognize what, what people that work around you or with you have and how can you leverage those strengths 
of people on your team. You know, it's always about surrounding yourself with good people. You know, that's always a critical element, you know, as a leader. But, uh, you know, you mentioned fear. And I think that's we really, that's that. something we talked about, <laughs> that, about that coming up the road. You know, fear is a very powerful emotion. And fear can really stymie you and cause you to be so still that you feel like you can't move to the right or to the left. And we've all experienced some type of fear, you know, as we've, as we've gone up this ladder and trying to, to be business people. But I just, you know, I really encourage you to, to walk through any fear that, that you come into contact with because you're going to learn from it and just don't let it paralyze you because we, we have all had that experience. Yeah, and I would also say that, you know, always know that you have to have a plan B. I mean, congratulations <laughs> if plan A works out for you all, but it never worked out for me. So I would always tell this, my staff that, you know what, I would rather you tell me, I had to make a hundred calls just to get three appointments than for you to tell me you only book three appointments. Because then I'm gonna ask you a lot of questions. Like, well, okay, well, how many calls did you make then to get the three appointments? I always wanna know plan A, B, C, D. So if plan A works for you, that's great, but I'm gonna tell you in our line, probably with all of us sitting up here, plan A didn't work. So always be able, great leaders have a plan B, C, D. Um, sometimes just don't take no for an answer. You know, you have to just keep going. Um, and I think that's been the biggest success on, for me is actually having a plan B, C, D. Always know, okay, plan A didn't work, keep moving on. So. I would say um, don't limit yourself if you uh, stylistically. Everybody has a different style, and just because you have a different style doesn't mean you're, you, can, uh, you can't be a leader. It's being self-aware and leveraging your team. Okay, because that's what's most important. If someone's quiet, you know, sh can they be a leader? Absolutely. If someone's too talkative, you know, they can be a leader too, but they've got to learn when not to talk as much and listen. So all I'm saying is, is just be very self-aware. Don't be afraid of mistakes because really uh, making the mistakes is how you learn, but also admit to the mistakes because the minute you don't admit to the mistakes, other people see them and... It's um, just being yourself and being able to say, hey, I tried this, it didn't work. And going to your point, having the next step, you know, is really important because it, it just is. I'm just grateful for a plan B. I wanted to be Diane Sawyer. And uh, if those of you who know Nancy Lynch in the accounting department would be shocked to know I'm actually a banker today. So she, will, uh, she would say, dear God, she's not touching their finances, is she? <laughs> and I'm not. I'm not. I'm the pretty pictures person. But plan Bs are, plan Bs are important. When we talk a lot about women in business, we talk about a balance, having a work-life balance. And Sheryl Sandberg, who's COO of Facebook, has drawn quite a bit of criticism and equal amounts of fanfare in the past year uh, with her books and her remarks and speaking engagements. But one of the things she said is, there's no such thing as work-life balance. There's work, and there's life, and there's no balance. And then she went on to note that women can only reach their full potential in the world as people become more and more accepting of powerful and, and successful women. So, Diane, you have a unique story to kind of kick us off talking about having a work-life balance, you know, having three small children, um, growing a business, and um, just let's talk a little bit about the work-life balance and how it has impacted you through the years. Yeah, I mean, I didn't choose this life as far as husband dying and three small children, and I think a lot of times people thought, I, I read the corporate minutes when I was at a corporate meeting and it said it's gonna be hard it's gonna be hard for her like they had not you know they didn't think anybody could run 11 offices real estate companies I have a private foundation um, and I think bottom line is I don't think it's as much balance as for me personally it's blending um, I never missed any activities and my kids were very active um, in a lot of sports, I coach soccer for eight years, and I will tell you that's why she's <laughs> laughing at me on soccer. I mean, I loved coaching that soccer team. And I think, you know, for, and I used to always tell my staff, you should pay for our uniforms because I take the stress out on these little kids rather than, <laughs> um, you know, coming and taking it out on you. So um, I think you blend a lot where, you know, I would jump on airplanes in um, San Francisco to be back here for to see my son play soccer at, um, in high school, um, which was a good thing because he always got, you know, um, 
or concussions, uh, you know, he was always 58, yeah, 58 <laughs> stitches in his eye with a header, you know, those kind of things. But I never missed it, any of their activities. But I also will tell you, after they, I put them to bed when they were little at 9 o'clock, then I would get my paperwork back out, or I would then do the things. And even now, I, I have three adult children. One's in um, L.A., one is in San Francisco, and my daughter is in, those are both boys, and then I have a daughter in Columbus. And um, I make a promise to them that I will be with them on their birthdays. And we always try to do neat things like hot air balloon. We all went skydiving out of the same airplane. So we all jumped, you know, 13,000 feet. Uh, although I don't know if you saw the news yesterday where the guy yes, that was had a crazy. seizure and jumped. Ugh. Yeah, not so fun. Um, but, you know, we try to do a lot of things together. It's a lot of good family time, um, you know, and, and it's... In my lifetime, it's all about moments. You know, I talk to my kids every day, and people think, you know, I remember when my kids went off to college, and they called, and they said, you know, Mom, there's people here that hate their parents. Um, you guys are not always going to have your parents. I'm a prime example. Bad things happen um, to a lot of good people. With my dad, uh, a best friend, a guy that I dated, was in a work accident and became a vegetable, is still living in a convalescent center. You know, Things like that happen, so I think, you know, take the moments, enjoy them, um, have fun with life, because it's a gift. It really is. Every day, um, like I love, you know, some of you saw me walking around and, and talking to students. I love working with kids. I love working with students. Um, if ever I can help you guys find jobs, that's what I do. You know, if you would have told me way back when that I would be employing 3,500 people every year, I'd be like, right. <laughs> um, so I do think you can balance, but you can blend. And, and you know what? Every day, enjoy it. And just, you know, take a moment and, and do something special with it. So. Great. Um, we have about 10 more minutes left in our discussion, and then we're going to open up the floor for Q&A. Um, switching gears a little bit and talking about um, influences in your career and the impact of mentoring. It's you know no secret that a, a mentor relationship can guide a career trajectory, can uh, change you for the better. Um, Georgette, why don't we start with you and talk about the impact of people mentoring you in your career and the impact on people that you have mentored? Um, I really didn't realize when I got out of school and I took that sales job uh, that I was going to be lucky enough to get a boss that was my mentor too. And I didn't realize when I went into sales that I was the product. So he took the uh, he took the saw to the you know rounded out the edges and things like that. So finding someone who is going to take the time to be interested in you and be honest with you and tell you what you do well and tell you what you don't do so well. And um, because that's the only way you're going to be able to grow. You know, we can't always see, you know, what's in the mirror. Um, but I was very blessed to have him for almost 10 years and I still quote him today. But there are other ways, I learned as time went on to find other mentors. Some people, um, no, they're my mentor and some people don't because you can learn from so many people. Uh, you've just got to find somebody that is willing to be honest with you. And I, you know, anyone who's willing to be honest with you it has the potential of being a mentor. Um, I have enjoyed mentoring different people at different times. You know, and it, the amount of time uh, can be short or it can be long. You know, there's a reason, a season, or a lifetime. And so it's... It's all about just finding someone who will help you grow. Um, it was funny because a couple of years ago in Charleston, we had a panel like this, and I, I was getting ready to talk about mentors. And at the time I had accepted that, I had not been diagnosed with breast cancer. So I found my latest role of having mentors was other women that had gone before me. So I had um, my son's uh, my son's girlfriend's mother. I called her up and said, uh, I'm calling, I need some help, but it's not about the kids, because we were always comparing notes because our children did not do well together. Um, so, you know, she walked me through, she and a couple other women walked me through what I would be walking through, and so it's not just the career, it's every stage of life. So, and I, what I like to think about, and I, you know, is pay it forward. If someone helps you, pass it on to someone else, okay? That's... Um, how I've kind of lived my life, and I've been, it's um, been a blessing to be able to pay forward. 
Okay. Um, before we get to advice, I did want to ask a question, and I had thrown this to the group as we were planning the way the conversation would go, but one of the things that I was interested in, only being on campus, um, I live here in Morgantown, I've taught at the journalism school or the Reed School of Media, and obviously um, you all are highly connected. You have your cell phones, you have accessibility, you have information when and how you want it. So I wanted to pose the question to the panel. I'm going to start with Kathleen because you're uniquely qualified, I think, as we talk about how people communicate and how they interact, how the impact of what, you know, this generation is called the me generation by people who are defining you. How people, um, how you impact the workforce, what you need to know as you go and interview for jobs, uh, and, and what to expect. So we'll start there, the impact of technology. Yeah, well, the impact of technology, I think, I mean, golly, you guys, I mean, you've had an unbelievable opportunity to learn. I mean, I made a joke That's earlier, true. right? You didn't know what a word processor was. You say Google it. <laughs> I mean, you know, back in our day, you know, you probably don't even remember what the Dewey Decimal System is, probably, but, you know, that was our Googling it in the library. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, you look at the impact of that instant communication, and that's really what's expected. That's the expectation now, you know, that you can get things instantly. You can find anything out. So as from a business perspective, you know, what I do with connecting people to jobs and helping people develop themselves and develop careers, it's critical that they learn all the technology that's out there because you've got so many opportunities. And our platform that we actually utilize, I'm actually a part of a, a larger company that we have a global assessment process. So our delivery is, is instantaneous. You know, anybody that takes our instruments, they expect that. The employer expects that. You know, how quickly can I get the result? So technology is a huge piece of what we do, and um, our company is really uh, proud that we have a, a real strong um, rating as far as uh, technology safety and the information is to be held and to be held, you know, to be confidential. But I think you guys, you know, the world's at your fingertips. And I love that from a business perspective. I learn things every day. You know, I made a joke up here. The thing I love about technology is you can expand your font, thank God, on your iPhone <laughs> because I'm always searching for my reading glasses, you know. But, but technology is so powerful, and the way you can market yourself now through technology is, is really incredible. And I just think this, you know, good old corny phrase, the sky's the limit, but aren't we getting ready to get into the, what, the internet of everything? Is that not the new, the new phrase? So, I mean, wow, what an opportunity. And I think, you know, it proves anybody can do anything. Look at all the businesses that are born because you have the access to technology. You know, you have an idea, bam, you can put it out there. There's free ways to put it out there. So, you know, I use every, every, every portal that I can basically get my hands on, you know, from Twitter to Facebook to Hootsuite to I'm always learning something new. Thank God I have a daughter that's a programmer and she fixes everything that I mess up. <laughs> so it's great she doesn't like working for free, but um, I think technology is just it's something we can't avoid in business. You know, it, it, it is what it is. It's coming fast and furious, and I think it's, it's a very positive thing in my world, I know from a business perspective. All I'm going to say is, uh, thank God that they cannot create hotel rooms on TripAdvisor. I mean, <laughs> you know, or on the internet. So, but TripAdvisor is another thing. TripAdvisor, we make, you know, if we get a bad review and we get three of them in a row, people aren't going to stay at our hotel, or they're going to we're going to lose sales. And so, the value of our business is all based on TripAdvisor. That's pretty powerful. And our industry has changed a lot in the fact that, you know, anybody can go to manpowerjobs.com and submit their resume, and, and then we follow up on that. I, I, it's amazing, but we still, you know, for the people and the companies that we hire for um, throughout the state, I mean, you still have to go through an interview. I will say, though, my one little tiny piece of advice for this, and we, I'm with all the major companies, and we do all the hiring for them, that make sure you use the technology to not only submit your resume, but also follow up, but also every time, and this is immediate, if I interview for my own staff and I do not receive a follow-up letter, that resume never moves off the corner of my desk except to go to the pile that I'm not going to hire you. So I always tell people, use technology. We want to hear whether, you know, hey, you know, it has to be a good decision for the companies that are hiring as well as for you, the person that it's just not a job, but you want them to hire you. So always, you know, use that technology to your best advantage that you also send that follow-up letter because it's so important. Um, you know, I have a CEOs and presidents that call me all the time and say, 
you know, Diane, I need somebody. This is what I'm looking for. I will teach them. Every company needs to teach you what their particular company is about, but they're looking at, you know, your soft skills, you know, so always make sure during an interview, you know, you talk about dependability and showing up on time and attendance because that's what people, I don't care what I'm hiring for right now, that's what they're looking for. So use that technology, research the company too before you go and interview with that's them. That's really important. Absolutely. Yeah. Because if I ask somebody, you know, well, tell me a little bit, you know, what you know about the company, and they say, well, I really don't know. I think you're part of an, uh, I think you're part of a U.S. and we're an international <laughs> company. Then I, you know what? If they, you have that. As Kathleen said, right now at your fingertips, we didn't have that. So yeah, use all of that. Be a little knowledgeable before you go in. Absolutely. I have a piece Someone of sends me a resume and the name is spelled wrong. I'm sorry, Becky. Go ahead. I have a piece of advice. Technology can be used for positive things and it can also be used for negative things. As an employer, the first thing we do when we have a prospective employee that, we, that we're trying to, to search and interview is we look at uh, social media and see what we can find out about that person. So remember, all of your decisions have consequences. That's, that's good. Scares you a little bit, huh? <laughs> um, okay, as we wrap up, um, we wanted each of the panelists to give us a little bit of advice building on that. Vicki, why don't you take, kick us off? Advice you would leave our crowd with? Um, I would say always do your best, no matter what you're doing. And don't be afraid to be hungry for knowledge. If you're in a position of, of employment and you're hungry for knowledge and you have passion and you care about what you're doing, Opportunities will present themselves to you. Kathleen? Sure. Um, I'm just a firm believer that you, uh, you get what you give. And I think it's really important that all of you all keep that in mind and always be open to giving back. It's very, very important. Diane? You know, I would probably say it's what I tell my kids. Um, I, no matter what's asked of you, go beyond. You know, just show people that when you're entering into the workforce, and I tell people this all the time, and, and running a temporary help service, and we do a lot of hiring, I always tell people, you know, I would tell all of you to go register at all your temporary help services, whatever territories you're in, what areas when you go back. And people go, yeah, but I want a full-time job. Well, let me tell you something. I know who's hiring. So I always tell people, do you think a president, a CEO of a company is going to read 50 resumes? And that's about the number we get when we post for any position out there. You get 50, at least 50 resumes for a good job. No, but they are going to see if your foot's in the door and you're doing whatever there and you're going beyond, most of the time people will call and say, you know what, I have an opening, but, you know, John's done such a great job, we're going to go ahead and hire him. So they make positions for you. So I always, I told my own kids when they graduated from college, register, put your foot in a lot of doors because that president and CEO is not reading resumes, but they are seeing that person that's in that work site. And nine out of ten times, those people are getting hired. So, just a thought. Georgia? Um, mine's kind of simple. I was very blessed to have won an award with um, HP, and I got to meet uh, Dave Packard and Bill Hewlett. And when we got up there, uh, Dave Packard says, where do you go from here? You won this award. He goes, do what my dad says. Good work deserves more good work. And the thing to remember, though, um, with that is, don't be afraid to make mistakes. Get out there, give it your best shot, and learn from those. You know, you don't want to keep making the same mistakes over and over. But if you're not out there making mistakes, you're not trying hard enough because no one's perfect. And so give yourself a break and enjoy it along the way. Very good. Thank you all so much for a great discussion. So at this time, we'd like to open up the floor to questions from the audience. And again, there's a microphone here in this aisle and over here to my left. Hi, my name is Alexandria Jaco. I'm a senior, going to graduate in May, studying business management with a concentration in human resources. This semester, I became increasingly ex um, inspired by corporate social responsibility. And you guys mentioned like about giving back and, 
everything like that. And I just kind of like to know what your experience or what you contribute to co so corporate social responsibility. I'll go ahead and start. It's one of my favorite things. <laughs> Kathy and I do a, a lot of giving back as far as we're very involved with the YWCA in Charleston. Um, we also support the West Virginia Red Cross. Uh, I'm also active on my own city council. I have a seat there on city council. But, um, you know, it's just any way you can impact, whether it's through your local Rotary group. Um, we, I belong to the Rotary, and we, we impact education in various ways in our community. I just think it's very important that we all step up to the plate with corporate responsibility at whatever level. You know, even a little, the two of us, you know, we're not a large company, but there's just two of us, but you can still make an impact. And I think it's important to find out what your community needs are. You know, there's always a need in each community, but whether you have 11 offices spread across or, mm -hmm. or just one, there's a need you can find that you can meet. So I think that's a, a great thing to always be aware of. We started a program a couple years back. Um, we serve our pizzas hot and ready. Um, and when they are 30 minutes old, we, we um, discard them to the side. And we're not supposed to be donating them, but I, I partnered up with as many food banks and city missions as I could. Because I feel like, gosh, that's great food, and there's nothing wrong with it. We've all eaten pizza the next day, so I'm what the heck. So I have convinced the corporate Little Caesars that we're going to do a food recovery program nationwide, and, and I'm doing a test pilot in that in Huntington right now. But we also do some work here in Charles, or down in Charleston and in uh, Beckley and Bluefield. Um, I am heavily involved. In fact, so much so that I started my own foundation because uh, when my husband died, I just didn't really want to do the flowers and people. So I um, put all the money up and I did a soccer field uh, in the city of Charleston. And then now I did a foundation so my kids we all make a decision every year of what organization. So every year we give personally, um, we give corporately from the company, but personally we give a lot of money away every year to organizations that have made a difference in their lives as well as um, the CAMC Cancer Center for one was something I was very close to because of the brain tumor. Um, also, the YWCA, they were taken away with um, children at risk or with no um, art um, program. So I'm backing that now so the kids can come and draw and create and, and leave the bad situations that they're in. So uh, Boy Scouts, you name it. So, yeah, I'm very heavily involved. And I think, and especially coaching, I will tell you, the best thing I ever did was coach those kids. I still follow them. They've become doctors and different, and I absolutely uh, those are all my kids, you know, kind of a deal. So I believe very much in not only, you know, working with sitting on, you know, different boards that I do, but also working with um, underprivileged children in any way that I can help. So, yeah, I think it's real important. <laughs> We're pretty much the same way. We do a lot of, um, we, we try to pick different areas, whether it be uh, the children or the, the local hospital or different areas that we can focus in on. And then on a totally different twist, um, we're also working because we have in the hotel side, we have so much, you know, there's energy being used, there's towels that don't need, you know, laundered. How do you educate the guests and how do you get the guests, you know, to say, um, uh, reuse the towel, you know, just things like that. So there's, there's both the volunteer side as well as the ecological side. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Other questions? Oh, you guys cannot be this shy. There's a couple of them. There. <laughs> okay. Yes. Come ahead. Go ahead into the to the microphone if you would, please. You both can. You can. Go ahead. You're already there. <laughs> Keep going. Hello. Okay. Um, so. My name's Tim. I'm president of uh, the Management Information Systems Association, uh, which is a technology-based major in business. Um, our male-to-female ratio is pretty abysmal. Uh, so I was wondering if you could just talk about um, some of the challenges in, in, in getting women to the technology-based fields. Well, technology-wise, I think... I think it's, I don't know whether it's in the high school or in the um, early years of college where sometimes the math orientation, 
I, you know, I was one of one, probably three women in, uh, maybe two in the engineer, the whole the um, electrical engineering world, and I really struggle with it because I think it's such a great field. I mean, I think the math and this, you know, I, I just think there's a lot of intimidation about it, and there, there's no reason to be because I think once you learn that you can do it, it's just. It's just a different way of thinking, and I don't know the way to uh, encourage that. Um, maybe more education, maybe yeah, more well, awareness. Yeah, I, I think it's really just exposure. You know, my daughter just graduated in May as a programmer, and um, she's in a very male-dominated field. I mean, like you said, it is abysmal, and I've encouraged her to try to give back from what her knowledge is now, and you know, start some small programming you know, workshops, you know, you've got to get these girls yeah. exposed at a very young age and help them understand what's out there, you know, and I think the more that you can give them the confidence, I just, yeah, yeah, it's just the exposure, and, and, you know, I was all for her, she didn't know what she was doing in school, she went to college and did that, you know, like a gerbil in the wheel, came home and cried first <laughs> semester, you know, I'm not going to be able to do medical school, I can't do it, it's too hard. So, yeah, you know, I made her sit down and take an assessment that I had, and she was like, oh, wow, I never thought about computer science, and she's wonderful, it's and I just don't think people think that way from a female perspective, and I think the exposure, you know, anything that you all can give the exposure is where it's all about, and I mean early, you know, junior high. I think we got to break stereotypes. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, there's a lot of, I think it's just presumed. Um, I, I pushed my daughter into econ, and, you know, at the beginning, when the math got tough, she was about ready to pull back. And it's like, you can do this. And once she got through it, and once <laughs> her confidence built, she was fine, and she's done great in econ. But there were moments where she didn't, she felt like she wasn't doing well enough. Very good. Thank you. Thanks. Last question. Uh, hi, my name is Dustin, and I'm a senior mathematics major. Um, my question was, you guys talk a lot about um, presented opportunities and giving back to the community. Well, uh, I have intentions of going to go work for a nonprofit in D.C. for um, women. It's the CFWC, I think is the abbreviation for it. Um, and a family friend is one that introduced it to me, but I think that... Um, Helping minorities, be it uh, women, the uh, LGBT, or um, just ethnic minorities in contemporary America is a really big way. So I was wondering your guys' thoughts on someone as young as I am uh, starting out my foot there rather than just jumping straight into the workforce as many of you guys did. I think that's very commendable. I mean, I think that's a great thing for you to start doing, you know, and giving back from that direction. There's so many of those opportunities out there now in the nonprofit world. And, I mean, it's just, I think it's a great thing that you're doing. Experience. Anything that you do that you can experience and, and get learn, you know, learn from it, that's all that counts. You know, yeah. the, as long as you're doing things where you are working, and I don't care whether you're working for a nonprofit volunteering, but uh, going out there and doing something and working towards an end goal is all you need to do to start. Get when, there. And work connected to passion is the best kind of work you exactly. can do. So. <laughs> passion and also just listening. And, and you know, you will get a wealth of opportunity. You'll learn just like all of us did when we talk about our first jobs. Um, and I would just say, you know, you have so much to offer to just, first of all, listen to people that were there, you know, that have been there, what they've done, and to listen to the people. You'll be on your path, no matter, like Georgette says, whether it's profit or nonprofit, it's the skills that you're going to be, you know, learning. And as uh, Kathleen says, it, it's a passion. It's what you have a passion for. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good Thank luck. You. Thank you all for joining us this evening for the Distinguished Speaker Series. Have a good evening.